I'd like to introduce Gal Beckerman from the New York Times Book Review, and he will introduce our presentation today. Um, thank you, and I guess let's get started. Let me introduce the two of you. Um, short introductions. If there's something Please. in particular that you want me to, uh, that you want to elevate about yourself after I, I give these, then, then you can jump in. Um, but David Troyer is the author of The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. Um, he's the author of novels as well as nonfiction, and he teaches literature and creative writing at the University of Southern California. Um, and next to him is Colin Calway. Um, the book that we're talking about today is The Indian World of George Washington. He's a professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. Um, and his book, The Indian World of George Washington, was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2018. Um, so let's just jump right into it. I have questions for each of you, but I think there will be overlapping themes um, between the two books and between your, your, both of your, of your work. Um, David, let me start with you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I want to I wanna start by talking about um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which I understand was a kind of an inspiration of sorts for you doing this book. It's a book that you write about uh, kind of capturing a lot of hopelessness and poverty and squalor. Those are words actually in the book about the world that it's describing, the, the Native American world it's describing. Um, and your book, self-consciously, is a sort of corrective. So, yeah. so, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I read Dee Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, in 1990. Uh -huh. I was 20 years old. Um, it, was, it, it happened to be on the 100th anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee. And um, Dee Brown's book was, I mean, Dee Brown was a really sympathetic, um, really, really vigorous champion um, you know, of and for Native people. And, and yet his book perpetuated a, a pretty accepted way of viewing Native people and Native history and Native communities. He writes in the introduction to that book, my book starts in 1850 and I end in 1890 and I mostly cover the Plains War as a time of un, unparalleled greed and blah, 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 blah. And I end in 1890 at the massacre at Wounded Knee where the culture and civilization of the American Indian was destroyed, full stop. I'm a 20-year-old kid. <laughs> who just got to college from Leech Lake Reservation, where right. you know, my mother's Ojibwe, I'm Ojibwe from Leech Lake Reservation, my father's not. Um, and I just left my community, which, which has its problems, but is not defined by only poverty and hopelessness and right. squalor. It's not defined, you know, our culture and civilizations are alive and fairly, doing fairly well. And that story hadn't been told the story of Native American life mm. had not been told. Stories of Native American death, well, we've heard those. <coughs> and so I felt like there was a book missing. And Toni Morrison said that if there's a book you really want to read and it doesn't exist, it's up to you to write it. Right. And so that stayed with me and stayed with me and, I, and I, it felt imperative, it felt critical. Because now I have children of my own. Mm. It felt critical to provide something for them, for, for myself, for the entire world, that looked at the ways in which Native folk have been making our own history. Mm. Not just, history is not just a litany of abuse. History is not just a list of things which we have somehow survived. But it's something we've made. And I felt like we needed that. And, and so that that wouldn't be the last word as well, it sounds like. Right. So, so I, like, D. Brown ends his book in 1890, and I begin mine in 1890. Right. And I bring the stories of Native lives up to the present with the opposite thesis, that 1890 wasn't the end. It was just a low point from right. which we've been emerging. Right. So, Colin, let's, go, let's <laughs> jump back 200 years. Um, and your book is about George Washington uh, and his Indian world. Um, but I'm very, you emerge with a quite nuanced picture uh, of Washington on the issue of Native Americans. Um, and it's not, it's not entirely the kind of bleak picture that I would have imagined. Um, I mean, it's partly it is, but there's this other kind of right. element. Right. Um, so, Talk a little bit about kind of the, the kind of the realism and the, the even more moral kind of elements of the way that Washington thought about Native Americans. Yeah. So actually, a chilling moment here. David said he read 
bury my heart at Wounded Knee in 1990, and I realized I read it in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a kid. Thanks for that, David. Um, Welcome. <laughs> but actually, it, it, it reminds me that that, that shadow of that kind of history looms large backwards. And one of the reasons for doing this, this book about George Washington's time was, I think it's that those attitudes have shaped how we think about the earlier history, right? That Indians were defeated, they were dispossessed, their story was over by 1890. So it was never gonna, it, there was never any real power and presence there in 1790, because we know how the story played out. Mm. It's very different. Uh, and, then I, and I wanted to get that omnipresence and that power uh, back into the picture. And Washington, of course, is the vehicle to do that. And he became, a, for me, a much more interesting person than I would expected, mm. and that perhaps many of us think. I mean, on the one level, as a historian of Native American, for me, he's the town destroyer. He's somebody who uh, advocates and implements policies of cultural erosion. Um, and there's a lot of bad stuff to lay at the feet of George Washington. And yet, having read so much of his correspondence with Henry Knox uh, and other people, I can't say that that's all there is to it. He spends too much time and ink and energy worrying about what he would call the Indian problem. It's not the Indian problem, it's his problem and it's the United States problem. And that is, two things going on here. One, we're gonna take Indian land, no question. The nation is predicated on the acquisition of Indian land. That is how the nation was going to be built. So that's never an issue for Washington. The issue is, how do we do that and still look good? Right? How do we do that and still maintain our honor as the new nation on the block, the democracy? We need to look good to the nations of the world. We need to look good to our own citizens. We need to look good to posterity. And he agonizes over that, and of course, he never reconciles that. But he wrestles with that in a way that some, some later presidents, I think, do not. Is it, is, it, is it just a question of looking good, or was there, was there a kind of element to the way Washington actually saw the native population that, that gave them, that imbued them with a certain amount of, of, of rights or, or of, I mean, you have, a, there's a letter that you quote um, from Henry Knox, the Secretary of War, in which he says, Indians possess the natural rights of man, yeah. which I was shocked to read, because I wouldn't have imagined that that's the way they would have been thinking about those populations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're so, you know, we, we now we're conditioned to understand that there was only a certain, uh, only white men <laughs> were really the, the, who they were talking about when they talked about natural rights of men. So, so that was a kind of a shocking phrase, uh, mm -hmm. phrase to, to yeah. see. And I think one, <clears throat> the big, one of the big questions for the United States at the end of the revolution, when it's won its independence, and it's won from the British all of this land, which was not British land, uh, is what will be the place of Indian people in this new republic. Mm -hmm. And I think for Washington, being able to carve out a place for Indian people is an important goal. But it comes with very, very clear provisions. Uh, and as his thinking and his Indian policy develops, <clears throat> there will be a place for Indian people in the new republic to the extent that Indian people live like Americans. So uh, assim an assimilation that would allow them... Assimilation, and of course it's tied in to the larger goal of expansion because living like Americans, becoming civilized in Washington's mind and the mind of Americans at that time means following a sedentary way of life and practicing American-style agriculture. Now, Indian people have been farming east of the Mississippi for hundreds of years, but the wrong people are doing the farming. Women are farming. Mm. In, the, in Washington's view, the men have to do the farming. And if the men do the farming and they spend their lives behind a plow, they need less land than they do if they're hunting. 
and that land will become less valuable to them as American settlers press on it. So we can help you. We can take that land off your hand and give it to deserving American farmers. So he's, he's shaping a, a policy and a, a set of principles that should work hand in hand. And in his rosy glassed moments, Washington sees this as a possibly a, almost a natural process, mm. that Indian people will give up their land as they make the transition to American way of life. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be a good exchange. Right? We will get their land, and they will get the benefits of American civilization. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that the Founding Fathers generation wrestles with. Um, in 1830, Congress answers that question, what will be the place of Indian people in the United States? With the Indian Removal Act of 1830, where the answer is there will be no place right, right. for Indian people in the right. United States. David, I'm, I'm curious as somebody who's, you know, there's, there's a big chunk of your book in the beginning where you also do kind of a history yeah. um, leading up to the, that 1890 moment, and kind of when you hear the, the, about the conversations that the founders were having, you know, how does that change your understanding of kind of the place of um, of natives, Native Americans in in, Amer in American history? Well, I should say, yeah. There's my book starts in 1890, but then I realized I had to do a little backstory, mm -hmm. and so I said, well, I should go back a little further because people need to know why 1890 looked like 1890, and so then I did a little more backstory. And I'm like, well, no, I should go further back. And I ended up going back to 20,000 BC. Why I, stop there? <laughs> it, as, as one does. My editor was very alarmed. But, but I had a guide um, to help me through those, that wilderness. And it was, in fact, Colin's work, um, which I relied on so heavily to do the, the early parts, the early history parts of the book. Um, so I just want to thank you in public for your work, because it was hugely helpful. Um, not 20,000 BC. Not 20,000, but, <laughs> but a large part of it. I was, I was, I was at sea, and um, you provided so much direction, so I really want to thank you for that. How do my feelings about sort of the Founding Fathers change? I, don't, I mean, it's mixed. On one hand, you know, you have Mount Rushmore, and everyone on there has killed Indians. It's so hard for me to dig it, you know? You have Jefferson writing Adams, and he's like, you know... For my yeoman farmer, for my agrarian ideals to really work, we need land. And to do that, we need to get it from Indians. And the best way to do that, let's just sell them stuff and put them in debt. These are some secret memos he's writing, I think, to Adams. Let's get them in debt. Let's get them beholden to us. And then to satisfy those debts, well, they'll just trade their land for what we need, and they can go further west. So you have our founding fathers looking for ways to sort of disenfranchise. I mean, very consciously so. Um, native people on one hand. And on the other, you know, that early history shows us, and Colin's work shows us, and other, other people's work shows us, that um, native people weren't simply, the question wasn't simply, how are native people going to resist or defy or survive the American experiment, but that the American experiment ended up shifting and changing in relation to Native people, and Native people ended up shifting and changing in relation to America, and that, that all of us have kind of ended up growing up together. Hmm. Um, we have, Native people have shaped this country, hmm. fundamentally determined its shape. And I, I said this on C-SPAN, which is weird to say, just a few minutes ago, but <laughs> for example, we're used to thinking of as that the first real test of states' rights versus federal power as being over the question of slavery, but that is simply not true. The first test of states' rights versus federal power was negotiated in relation to Native people in the American Southeast over the question of the Indian Removal Act. That was the first test. Who matters most? What matters most? States, federal government, tribes, and so, that's just one example of many that sort of Native people have been at the center of America's questions about how it will become itself yeah. since the beginning. You know, and as Colin points out, and as you pointed out in your question, there has been a kind of civil war going on since the beginning. And it's been a war about sort of how does America reconcile its stated ideals with its, with its lived practices. Right. 
that, that was the case from early days, and it's been the case at Standing Rock in 2016, right. where you have people trying to stop energy partners from building a pipeline through, through sacred lands to, mm -hmm. to the people of Standing Rock. And the larger question is, what matters more? Private enterprise? Who, who has more power and who should be listened to more and who matters more? Corporations or the common good? Mm -hmm. That's the war we see at Standing Rock. It's not Indians versus whites. It's corporations versus the common good, but it's Native people who are forcing that conversation right, right. into the public sphere. Right. It reminds me a little bit of the, you know, the Times' 1619 project and this, right. and this idea of um, kind of a, a America forming in, in relation to you know, how, it, how it treated African Americans and how it treated, mm -hmm. that, that you, can't, once you, you, can't, you can't remove that element from understanding how America becomes America. So, right, you want to yeah. understand this country, you have to understand that it was you know, built using um, black labor, using Indian land. Right, right, Absolutely. right. That's how the country was built. And you can't ignore one part of that mm -hmm. triumvirate. Right. David, you, you say that we Indians often get our, ourselves wrong. And I'm, I'm just curious to kind of dig a little bit more into that. Yeah. Um, is, is it buying the narrative that, that, that you know, sure. bury my heart narrative that, that for, for yourself or? I mean, you hear these stories over and over and over again, right. whether you're native or not. And this, the, the stories, America is shaped by narrative, among other things, right? And so native people like me growing up on my reservation, where there was a lot of difficulty where I'm from, a lot of, a lot of struggle. Um, it becomes the only thing you can see after a while. And so, sure, like for me, growing up, I couldn't help but agree that sort of our lives, sort of our, you know, our autonomous lives had ended some point in the past, and what we had wasn't life, it was just perpetual suffering. And that reservations are, are places of pain, and history is only that which we've somehow endured without really living. That's how I felt growing up. There's nothing good here. This is where good ideas go to die. Mm. I'm like, I gotta get out of here. And I left. Within months, I'm like, oh man, I miss this place. <laughs> I miss my family. I miss my tribe. I miss my religion. I miss the landscape. I miss, I miss sort of all of this, the, sort of the texture of what had been my native life growing up. Mm. And I wasn't missing suffering, right? That's not what I was missing. I was missing so much more than that, but I didn't have a narrative for that. So, so writing my book wasn't a matter of presenting an alternative history to Dee Brown's. I had to come up with an alternative narrative. Right. Not a narrative of loss, but a narrative of, of surplus. Not a narrative of suffering, but a narrative of, of energy, and life. Um, I needed it because I was sick of having the same discussion in public with non-native people, like, yes, I'm native, like, no, it doesn't suck. Because we go kind of crazy, right? Because you hear one of two things when you talk to people who aren't native. People are like, oh, you're native, that's so beautiful. And you're like, you have no idea how hard it is. How dare you say it's pretty? How dare you, how dare you want what we have? You don't, it's hard what we have. We, our lives are difficult. And then you hear someone, someone will meet you, like, oh, you're native, that's so difficult. You're like, no, it's not, it was beautiful, man. <laughs> And so we go a little insane. And I said, I want something that captures all of it. And to do that, I had to, my book is history, it's reportage, but it's also memoir, because I had to take a little journey inside, yeah. too. Um, Colin, can you talk just a little bit about the proclamation of 1763? Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I found that sort of revelation, you know, when, when I was looking at your book, um, and actually also, the, the kind of the argument that you make using the proclamation of 1763 about why the Revolutionary War might have happened uh, reminded me also of the 1619 project, which, you know, one of the controversial elements in the way that, 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 that they told, they kind of retold the story was that the Revolutionary War happened so that the colonists could, so that Americans could preserve slavery, which they were worried that the British might take away from them. Um, and so similarly, you're, you're, you're kind of making, there is a thesis in the book that at least one of the reasons, I don't know how central you place it, that, uh, that the war was fought was that so um, the colonists could have access to lands that the British were keeping uh, kind of out of bounds. Um, so could you, could you just describe a little, because it, it's a radical kind of rethinking of, 
of the Revolutionary War um, in the way that the 1619 folks have done, you know, kind of moving it away from the realm of kind of ideological revolutionary ideas and more towards a kind of materialist understanding of you know, why, why they needed to push back. Yeah. So I'm not sure it's that radical a rethinking of the revolution because the revolution, the American Revolution, was a war for freedom. But that included the freedom to get Indian land. Mm. Right? And Indian people know that. They understand that. That's why most of them side with the British, not because they particularly like the British, but because they know that for Americans, this will be open season. And what had happened was that at the end of the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, <coughs> um, the French had been defeated. The British, part of the reason why that had happened was that Indian people had made, in the Ohio Valley, had made peace with the British, and that gave them the green light to advance and take over French fortresses because, yet again, French power in the interior depended not so much upon French troops and French uh, gunfire as it did upon Indian allies. With that removed, the French were done. But at the end of that war, the British then forgot the promises they'd made to the Indians, which resulted in uh, a war that's often called Pontiac's War. I actually call it the First American Revolution because the Indians in 1763 in the Ohio Valley Great Lakes do what the Americans do 12 years later, and that is they take on the largest empire in the world, and they give it a bloody nose. To prevent that kind of thing happening again, the British issue the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And what that does is basically say everything from the Atlantic to the Mississippi is British territory, but west of the Appalachian Mountains is Indian country. It's reserved Indian territory. That's not a permanent situation, but what we're saying is only the king's agents, the duly appointed king's agents, can make deals with Indians the representatives of their tribes for a formal transfer of Indian lands. What we cannot have, because it will produce endless conflict and bloodshed, is settlers and independent companies and everybody just going over there, cheating the Indians out of their land, etc. So what they did was run an imaginary line basically down the Appalachian Mountains. Said, what east of this is British settlement, west of it is Indian country. Right? Now, that did not restrict frontier settlers, right? Scotch-Irish pioneers, for instance, from going across the line and settling in Indian land. Right? The Brits would try and chase them off. They'd, they'd come back. But that's not why, and I've said this many times before, but I can't resist saying it in this <laughs> country. They were going to build a wall, but they couldn't get the Indians to pay for it. <laughs> but uh, now I've said it here, I can't ever say it again because it's out. <laughs> but the people who it really affected were the people who, for oh, almost 20 years or more, had been speculating in Indian lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. And those people were people like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, the Lee family of Virginia. Many of the elite who become the most radical, most pronounced voices for revolution. Because those people, in the case of George Washington, he had fought in the French and Indian War thinking of himself as a British subject. That was frustrating in many cases when he couldn't get a, a royal commission, but he still saw himself as part of that empire. And I think when the Royal Proclamation happens in 1763, what that means for people like Washington is that old French-Indian alliance that had prevented them moving west, selling their land, and making a killing has been replaced by a British-Indian alliance. Right? And so the empire for which they fought are now thwarting their ambitions because there's not only a cloud over their title, but the buying and selling of Indian land is now to be done by the central government. And Washington rails against that. Now, 20 plus years later, when he's president, 
Congress passes a measure to do much the same kind of thing because it's the perennial problem of how the central government controls the frontier. Mm. But this is a huge part of that road to revolution. And both, there's two elements to it. The one we already know about, which the Brits tax the colonists. Right? Well, one of the reasons the Brits tax the colonists is that after Pontiac's war, they realize they're going to have to leave an army in North America, 10,000 men. That's going to cost a bundle and British taxpayers are taxed to the hilt at the end of this First World War. So some bright spark comes up with the idea, well, let's tax the colonists. Right? Um, we all know that. That's a standard part of our narrative of the coming of the revolution. Um, but I think the, the proclamation and that closure of access to Indian land is equally important. And when the revolution's fought, one of the things that's fo it's being fought for is to remove that king's tyrannical attempt to stifle the buying and selling of Indian land. Hmm. Um, I wanted actually you both to address this next question um, to kind of you know muse on the on the notion of sovereignty because you buy, it come, the word comes up in 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 both of your works. I'm just going to read little quotes from both, and it, it's kind of the, the optimism I feel that kind of I can emerge from both of your books with is wrapped up in this idea of sovereignty. So David, you write that to believe in sovereignty, to move through the world imbued with the dignity of that reality is to resolve one of the major contradictions of modern Indian life. It is to find a way to be Indian and modern simultaneously. Um, and Colin, you write, you know, about the, 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 the efforts to extinguish Native Americans, that, um, that their sovereignty was never extinguished. And so, um, maybe David, starting with you, sure. if you can kind of deepen our understanding of what, is, what does sovereignty mean in the context of uh, Native American lives in, in, in America? I mean, sovereignty is at the basis of our understanding of tribal nations you know, we understand ourselves to belong to, and this is a, a, a legal designation, right? Being Native is not just a racial or cultural designation in the United States, it's a, it's a legal designation. And the basis of that is, is sovereignty. You know, that we um, have our own sovereign Indian nations with our own laws, our own customs, um, our own, often, our own courts, our own constitutions, you know? And to remember that, right, is really important. So many people misunderstand um, the native legal situation as one of social welfare, that we have reservations as, form, as prisons. In those prisons, we are given health care. And this is how people think of it, given. We're mm. given health care. We're given schools. And people think we're given casinos. None of these things were given. OK. You know, um, this is not, these are not pity payments for poor treatment that we've received over some centuries. As sovereign nations, we have our own systems. Mm -hmm. And to remember that, that our treaty rights are rights that we've reserved, rights that we've always possessed. Um, and to remember that, to remember that's, that, that how we live is not just you know, at the behest or, or because of the, sort of the kind feelings of this or that liberal administration, but these are the rights we've always possessed prior to the coming of Europeans to this country. Um, affects how you act. It affects how you see yourself. It affects how you move through the world. It's important. Okay. Colin, do you have any? Yeah, and I think um, one of the <clears throat> neat things about working with George Washington, getting back to this sort of ambivalent picture that I present of him and have of him, is his own ambivalence, because you can quote him on other sides. So if, 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 if people say, well, are you saying that George Washington advocated genocide? I said, no. The word he used was extirpate. It means much the same thing. And sometimes people say, well, you're talking about sovereign Indian nations. It, it, what, what do you mean by that? Is that something you're making? A, I said, no, I'm not. George Washington regarded Indian nations as sovereign Indian nations. Because the Constitution says that treaties with foreign powers 
will be ratified by a two-third vote of the Senate. George Washington made it clear to the Senate that that provision, those provisions, applied to Indian nations as well. And the treaties that David mentioned are fundamental because treaties, by definition, are agreements between sovereign nations. Right? They are not treaties in which the United States gives Indian things. Uh, they are often treaties in which Indians give up land in return for pledges right? that are still, uh, still on the books, as it were. So for me as a historian, I think um, that point that David made about Indian people being political entities is, is huge. And that when we look back to, say, the 18th or the 19th century, we should see not Indians simply uh, reacting en masse against European invasion, but see multiple Indian nations. Right? Somebody made the point yesterday about feeling his life was not lived on the margins, it was central, and I think that's true for Indian nations. And so I often think we should look at Indian nations on the map of North America, hundreds of them, and see them as hubs that are at the center of a wheel with spokes going out, right? They are nations with their own foreign policies, which entail dealing with other Indian nations other European powers, and the United States. And that's the complicated political map that is North America mm. in 1600, 1700, and even still in 1800. And I would actually suggest that even today, yeah. if we take David's point, right, this is still a political map in which there's not one nation, there's not 50 states, but there are 573 federally recognized tribes. That's a very complicated picture, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, which is full of complications, but it could also be full of possibilities. Hmm. There's so much, like the, the early history and colonial history and, and prior to that in North America is so interesting. And there's a really good book, um, I think it's a great book, called Masters of Empire, um, which talks about Ojibwe, Ottawa, Potawatomi, like, uh, um, occupation of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and the Great Lakes. And he makes, the author makes this amazing point that it was foreign policy of this, of this tribal empire to empower the French if the British were strong, and then break those promises and empower the British if the French got too strong, because they knew very well that if you kept European powers wrong-footed all the time, the Indians would always win. And this was the lay of the land for many centuries in, in North America, to the extent that sort of my tribe, Ojibwe, was part of, this, part of this, this empire, this tribal empire. We would send delegations out to Iroquois country many hundreds of miles away by canoe yeah. and say, hey guys, what do you think about the British? You think they're getting too powerful? Would you attack them, perhaps? You know, would you help us? And then there'd be all these, all these alliances between tribes, which were oftentimes at loggerheads, because my tribe and the Iroquois tribes were often at war, too. And this balance of power that native tribes were able to execute as a kind of foreign policy agenda was only really, truly upset when America won the American Revolution, yeah. and then after the War of 1812 and all of that sort of, and then sort of the North America took the shape it had, and America was then the single power, and there was no one to keep wrong-footed any longer. Right. It's kind of cool stuff. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really cool stuff. You should read this stuff. <laughs> you know? It's, it's so cool, because it, it goes, runs completely against the ways we're used to thinking of right. the, you know, America's founding, but also of how tribes worked in North America and how we related to the British and the French and all of that. It shows a savvy kind of foreign yes, policy thing. we are political yeah. actors. Well, this, so this connects to my, to my last question, and then I'm going to open it up. It seems that as works of history, what connects both of your books is this desire to kind of return agency or to bring agency into, to Native Americans in, in, in history. Um, and so... I'm curious, kind of looking forward, like the work to be done, kind of where you see possibilities um, uh, for, for the future, for, for future work kind of in, this same, in the same territory. 
I mean, my work? <laughs> or just work? I mean, for you or for other historians, I mean, it's, it's the, the point being that, you know, exactly as you're, you know, as you're enthused right now about this notion of understanding kind of how, understanding them as actors, you know, and not just as being acted upon, you know, there's, there, are, are there parts of the history or, or, or certain um, kind of episodes that are, or, you know, that, that, that need to be looked at with a new lens. But, but there's so many qualified, amazing people doing it. I mean, Colin's doing it already. Yeah. Um, in a book called The Other Slavery, someone's talking about slavery in, in native populations, which started before the slavery of, of Africans and lasted longer and yeah. on, on, is ongoing today um, in the Americas. And this book, Masters of Empire, Collins' work, there's, there's so much being done. What, what more is there to be done? I don't know, like everything, <laughs> right? Everything. Colin, do you have any, any thoughts yeah, thought because, on that? Yeah, because um, sometimes people like me, um, not British people, people who are working in Native American history. <laughs> um, actually, if you think it's weird that a British guy is doing Native American history, the guy who wrote Masters of Empire, Michael McDonnell, was born in, in Wales, even though he had a Celtic, Scott's name. Born in Wales, grew up in Ontario, and now lives and teaches in Australia. Right. So this is global stuff, right, that we're doing here. But I think uh, um, people who work in Native American history are often accused of trying to take America's well-worn historical narrative, which is something that many people hold dearly, and turn it on its head. And I think what doing the Washington book <coughs> taught me or opened my eyes to was that I wasn't trying to turn it on its head, that even the historical narrative that we have about the United States doesn't make sense without Indians. Right. right? Exactly. There's lots of things simply don't happen if Indian people are not there, if Indian power is not there. And so if that's the canvas, and we're looking at hundreds of different nations, the possibilities for exploring and digging deeper mm. to either tweaking or refining or filling out fundamental aspects of the American story are endless. And that doesn't mean we're being unpatriotic or trying to turn it on its head. Mm. But as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, great nations deserve great history. Mm. Or he said something and I said something like that. <laughs> That's the phrase that, that comes to mind. Uh, and President Obama said much the same when he was opening the African American Museum. This is not, this is not heresy to question history, yeah. but this is actually the true democracy right. to incorporate all of the actors and all of the players and all of those experiences. Hmm. I mean, there's, just to, just to build on that, I mean, there's a tendency to pay attention to Native stories and to Native lives and Native history as a kind of liberal social act, as a kind of community yeah. service, right? Well, you know, we took all this land. The least I could do is read this book, you know, <laughs> watch this show. I mean, it's the least I can do. I'll just pay attention a little bit. But the fact is, as Colin points out, that you cannot understand American history unless you think about Native American history. Right. You simply can't. You know, and even in a contemporary setting, people have been asking me since I've been on book tour, don't you think the election of, of Sharice Davids is good news for Indian people in, you know, in North America? I said, I think it's good news for Kansas. <laughs> because a lot of Americans in this day and age of the wealth gap in, in our time of growing inequality are increasingly suffering from lack of education to health care, lack of education to, lack, lack of access to health care, lack of access to education, lack of access to capital and to credit. Many Americans are finding themselves in the position that Native Americans have been in for many centuries. And so her election, the election of Sharice Davids, Kansas, is not just good news for Native people. As a Native American woman, who better to help middle Americans who are finding themselves in the position that we've been in and that she's been in for a very long time? 
right? So you, you want to know where you're headed. You want to know what's happening to you. Well, you have to understand American Indian history because, hmm. folks, hmm. your lives are starting to look a lot like our lives. And in some ways, that's good, but in some ways, that's not so healthy. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> um, well, I want to give a chance for questions. So I cannot see, but are there, oh, look, people are coming to the, there's microphones on, on both sides. Uh, yeah, looks like we have somebody here. My name is Peter Beck, and first I'd like to thank the New York Times for bringing David's book to my attention. I think it's one of the most important books that I've ever read. Wow, thank you. And uh, well, I, for example, I was very conflicted about how I should think about casinos, and you disabused me of <laughs> any guilt I should feel about that. But one of the core messages <laughs> I took from your book was that Native Americans discovered that the ultimate weapon was not a gun, it was the law, and as you mentioned briefly and learning to use American law and the treaties that have been signed. And so I was wondering if you could comment. I was really uh, intrigued when the Cherokee Nation announced recently that they were going to advocate for their member of Congress that was promised to them way back when. Uh -huh. and, and two thoughts occurred to me. What took them so long to, <laughs> and this doesn't seem like the most opportune moment to be asking 1600 Pennsylvania or Capitol Hill for anything. And so how do you th see this playing out? And thank you again for the work you're doing. Thank you so much. I, it may not be opportune, um, but it's certainly necessary <laughs> in this day and age. Um, I used to think of Washington, D.C. as where people gathered together you know, to, to help the rest of the country. I was born <laughs> here. Well, you'd give me a break. You know? <laughs> And uh, it doesn't quite, quite feel that way anymore, but um, the Dakota who lived in Minnesota who were suffering horribly in the mid-19th century decided it was a very good time to attack um, in 1862 when America was in shambles. It was a good time to have some Indian Wars because America was involved in its own civil war and they sensing a moment of weakness, people, people rose up. Like maybe this is also that moment of weakness in civil war. <laughs> it's a really good time to rise up. But thank you so much um, for noticing that and for your question. Thank you. I could just piggyback on to that, that notion of sending representatives to Congress. Um, take a look at the Treaty of Fort Pitt in 1778. That year, the, the newly independent declared its independence uh, United States makes its first two international treaties. One is with France and the other with, is with the Delaware Indian Nation. <clears throat> and in that treaty with the Delaware, there is a provision that when the war's over, <clears throat> the Delawares can head an Indian state with representation in Congress. Now, of course, that never happened. But I think it, it's a reminder to us that the United States in making that was not doing that out of the goodness of its heart, but the, the power dynamics of the time. Right? The, the United States knew it needed a Delaware alliance, and Indian power was, was very real. Uh, and so that idea of an Indian state and that idea of representation in Congress goes way back. Let's take a question from this side over here. Hi. Um, thank you both for bringing this conversation to this history track. I really appreciate it. And actually, my question is directly flowing from uh, what you were just speaking about, about the m move for uh, Cherokee Nation representation. Do you see, um, how do you see that as paving the way for additional tre existing treaty rights to potentially be reclaimed or enforced? Um, do you see that as, as paving the way as for other treaty rights to be recognized that haven't been? I don't know if I see it paving the way, but it, it, it is one part of, of you know, myriad ongoing efforts um, to remind the government of its promises, which, which isn't just a, a moral reminder, it's a legal one. Treaties are the supreme law of the land. Um, they need to be honored and they need to be, they need to be kept. 
active. And that has been sort of the, 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 the hard work of, of many, many, many Native people who've, who've become either tribal leaders or come to work in the law. So I, I couldn't say how it's going to help or hinder or affect those, those ongoing efforts, but there are many, many ongoing efforts all over the place. You know, just speaking on a personal level, I mean, my dad moved here, my mom and dad moved here to D.C. Before I was born, my dad was working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, then he started to end up working for HEW and OEO. Um, my mom was, had been a nurse, but was no longer, and she was raising my brother and I. And, she, and my father asked her, he's like, look, Peggy, he said, look, you're stagnating, you need to do something. What do you want to do? If you could do anything, what would you do? She goes, oh, that's stupid, I don't know what to say, I don't want to say. He's like, no, just, it's just you and me, like, we're just talking here, what do you want to do? If you could do anything, we're just, we're just chatting. She goes, well, you know, we don't have any lawyers. And we always lose in court. And we need lawyers. He's like, well, why don't you do that? He was that kind of guy. Like, well, just do it. <laughs> and so while raising my brother and me, she, and then subsequently my twin younger siblings, she went to law school here at Catholic University, who admitted her provisionally because she did not have a college degree. And she went on to become the first American Indian woman judge in the country. Um, so she recognized, I mean, out of her experience as a young girl of having their, like, their games stolen by the game warden, their entire rice harvest confiscated because they were, they, they, were, they were told they were ricing out of season and off the reservation when neither thing was true, but they had no power. Right? So fighting for Indian rights, fighting you know, for treaty rights is crucial and ongoing, and I'm glad the Cherokees are doing that, um, along with all the other Native folk who are fighting in the courts. Let's take, we have time for one more question. Yes, I'd like to ask a question about uh, you know, the early republic that George Washington was, of course, the first president. Um, and considering he was so ambivalent about Native Americans and what to do you know, in terms of working with them, did he kind of tend to delegate that to the Secretary of State, to ambassadors, to the Congress? Because uh, as we know about George Washington, he doesn't always seek conflict when he already knew the British could at any time come back in and try to you know, remove us, basically. Did he, uh, did he think of it in terms of there was a diplomatic solution in terms of working with the uh, Native Americans, or was it all going to be eventually just a conflict and we were going to have to do it, obviously what happened, you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, it, it varies. Right? Um, and it, does he delegate? Well, it, he spends a lot of time working with Henry Knox, who's the Secretary of War, and who is the person primarily responsible for <clears throat> Indian Affairs at that time, because Indian Affairs was lodged in the War Department, which may give, gives us some idea of how they were thinking about it. Uh, it was then later moved to the you know, uh, Department of the Interior, which is where it still is, which is a strange place, not the Department of State. Um, but <clears throat> does he think of a military solution? Does he think of a, a diplomatic solution? Both. Yeah. Because the philosophy or the policy that I think Washington develops is that we will follow the British model and deal honorably with Indian people as we take their land. So the way to do that is make treaties with them where we give them a fair and honest price for their land. They will <clears throat> make those treaties, give up land, and then follow the American way of life, and there will be a place for them. So that's all well and good, but then what happens when Indians say, thanks, but no thanks? then Washington's language and tone changes. Then those Indians become recalcitrant savages mm -hmm. who must be expert to predate, <clears throat> and that requires being crushed in our hand, right? And he'd, he'd done that during the revolution by sending American armies into Iroquois country, burning 40 Iroquois towns, destroying crops, orchards, and tried to do that again. Well, when he tried to do it again in 1791, sending the American army into what is now Northwest Ohio, the Northwest Indian Confederacy 
destroyed the American army. They didn't just defeat it, they destroyed it. So as of November 4th, 1791, the United States had no army. Right? <laughs> this is a republic yeah. that's essentially yeah. this is two years after the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Jefferson says when the word reaches Philadelphia, nobody talked about anything else because it looks as if the whole thing's going to fall down. Right? And who's heard about that battle? Yeah. <laughs> Thousands of books about Custer yeah. and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Yeah. But the destruction of the only army that the United States had at the hands of Indians in Ohio in 1791. What does Washington do? Now diplomacy seems like an awful really, really idea. Really, good idea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you were in Philadelphia in 1791, 1792, 1793, you couldn't step out to buy a sandwich without falling, bumping into an Indian delegation because Washington was inviting Indian delegates to Philadelphia to talk about peace and friendship and all of that kind of stuff, but essentially also to buy time for the American army to be rebuilt and to prevent more Indians from joining that, conf that com Western Confederacy. And three years later, a new American army, um, which is remodeled, and again, this is a product of <coughs> defeat by Indians, um, reverses that, that verdict. But depending upon the circumstances, he's, he's willing to go either way. And there are certain Indian people that he sees as uh, deserving the benefit of his civilization program, and then there are others who will always be, uh, in his words, hostile. For Indian people, it, Indian people also uh, shift their policies and maneuver according to shifting circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I want to thank both of you so much thank for you. this fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.